Okay. Good morning, Tracy. How are you? I'm great, Carla. Thank you for having me. Oh, it, it is. It's amazing to connect with you. Like I said to you before, um, you have this quite possibly unknown influence on education in New Zealand through your amazing research and your writing. And it is an absolute privilege to host this chat with you this morning to to share some of your to to share some of your work with um, other educators across the country. So I'd just like to take a moment to introduce you to, to the people across New Zealand. Um, so everybody, I'd like to introduce this morning to you, Tracy Packiam Alloway. Tracy is an award-winning psychologist, author, and TEDx speaker. Uh, she has authored 13 books, uh, many of which I have read myself, but those latest uh, um, children, the latest children series that you have um, released. I'm really, really looking forward to to getting my hands on those. So, yeah, great to have you here with us this morning. Thank you for giving up your time. Of course, it's great to be here. <laughs> and so, Tracy, let's just begin with um, maybe if you would just uh, wouldn't mind starting with telling us a little bit about your work, and then I'd really like to get into what working memory actually is. Sure, um, Carla, a lot of my research focuses on, as you mentioned, working memory. And I like to, over the last 15 plus years, I've looked at working memory in the context of education, whether it's learning difficulties like dyslexia, ADHD, autism, but also on the other end of the spectrum with gifted individuals, working with national organizations and so on. Um, so really my research has covered the gamut from starting from, uh, in fact, two and a half year olds looking at language development, memory and uh, screen time, right up till college students and looking at meta awareness and how working memory works together with learning strategies and, and how we can make an impact in students learning. Wow, quite extensive, quite an extensive focus. That That's incredible. Could you now go into telling us, um, I guess, in, in the best way possible, we have a lot of parents who will be um, watching us this morning and also uh, classroom teachers. So sh could you come into exactly what working memory is? I like to think of working memory as our active memory. It's the memory that we're using to work with information. So when we're listening to a teacher tell us a new science fact, we're working with that knowledge. We're also working with the knowledge that we know in our long-term memory, and we're combining those two pieces together, the new with the old. Mm -hmm. And so we do know from a lot of research that working memory is very sensitive to the information that we already have stored in our long-term memory. So you, if you have some knowledge about, say, the solar system, learning a new fact about planets makes it easier because you can connect that with the mm. old. Likewise, and so it is something that I call our active memory. Now, sometimes I like to think of the image of a post-it note to illustrate working memory because it is limited in space. Uh, so we can only remember and work with certain amount of information at a single moment. Mm. We notice, Tracy, that a number of the children that we work with who have um, learning differences, and I know working memory spans not exclusive to children, just who have learning differences, but we do notice that children who have literacy and mathematical learning differences often present with, dare I say, um, a limited verbal working memory or a limited visuospatial working memory. Would you like to tell us a little bit about um, perhaps the differences in those types of working memory? That's such a great question, Carla. And I feel like sometimes you know, working memory is a concept we think is generic or general, that there's only one type of working mm. memory. When in fact, it's exactly as you put it, we have a verbal working memory that uh, focuses on our language center of the brain. So it's highlighting a Broca's area, which we know is responsible for language. And we also have a visual working memory, which taps more into our, our movement, our mental rotation, math reading, and so on. And so we know, for example, children with reading difficulties have differential working memory profiles. For example, they do have weaker verbal working memory. So when you're giving instructions verbally, that child is going to struggle. But if it's pictorial, if it's visual and they can read that, they have their superpower, their strength, which is a photographic memory. And that's a little bit about the theme of the children's books that you mm, mentioned. Yes. Where I highlight their working memory strengths. And so as an educator and as a parent, 
it's really important to know that it's not that their memory is going to be poor across the board or even great across the board, but they do have differential strengths and weaknesses. Mm. And, and in your experience, it, it's important to come from that strengths-based perspective. You know, once we, um, we see various assessments that highlight um, particular strengths and deficits in working memory, um, can you talk to us about, from an education perspective, um, how we might go about coming from that strength space? I like to think of it as sometimes if, if you have hurt your ankle and you're trying to force yourself to use that ankle when you're running or walking or jumping, it's not going to get you very far. And I feel like shifting that focus to a strength-based model moves it away from that hurt ankle to what actually is the strength in the child's learning profile. And so back again to the child with the reading difficulties, if we know that visual working memory is a strength, well, how can we harness that mm. in the class? How can we harness that when we're teaching them phonological skills and sound letter matching and so on? Instead of saying, hey, just listen, AT is at, because we're only going to get so far with that weakness-based model. But if mm. we know that if we're focusing on the strength, here's how we can really capitalize on their memory powers. Yeah, that's, um, that's really great to, to, to have that affirmation. I think at our end, a lot, of, a lot of the great work that is going on currently in New Zealand is about ensuring that the teaching and learning is very much multi-sensory for that very reason that you're just saying, you know, that we are in the first instance identifying the strength or the challenge of the student and then being sure to um, to come in from that strengths based perspective, but also very very much so in a multi sensory way. So yeah, that's that that's really great um, great affirmation. If we switch now, Tracy, and we think particularly, I love hearing you use the terms phonological and particularly brockers because I I, I get a little bit geeky and so excited inside. And and if we can just switch now and be thinking of those children who have literacy learning differences and, and we might say our children who are dyslexic or our, or our children even um, not, not so much who are hyperlexic, more so our children who are dyslexic and think about the impact of working memory for those children. Could you speak to that for a little bit, Tracy, as to how, what is the significance for those children of the working memory challenges they are faced with? That I think it's really important to answer that question to know how the brain is working in those individual children. So we mentioned Broca's area. So one of the things for those children is that their Broca's area is understocked, if you will. In other words, they don't have that word knowledge that they need in the same level as their peers. And so we do know from brain imaging studies, as a result, their working memory is stepping in. That's the prefrontal cortex right here. So mm. brain studies show that when a child with reading difficulties is reading a passage that may be at grade level but is difficult for them, their working memory is working extra hard. Now, what does that mean in real life or in real time? That means in the classroom, their working memory is doing the job of their reading center, their broker's area, and that also means that their working memory does not have any resources left to do the comprehension part. So a school teacher, a classroom teacher, even a parent may say, I'm pretty sure this child does not have reading difficulties. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, whether it's Harry Potter or these books at their age level. But when I ask them to tell me what they read, they can't. And that's a clear sign that the working memory has had to step in and do the what should have been automatized by their broker's area, reading those words. And as a result, their working memory is not able to do the comprehension piece. Mm. So that's clear sign behaviorally that we can look for can they maybe read but not do the comprehension part because they don't have any resources cognitive resources mm. left yeah that's that's um that's a, an absolutely brilliant explanation of course from an expert <laughs> and and now if i think about a particular um instance where we experience children have great difficulty um, with working memory capacity will often be when they go to write a sentence. So, uh, for example, 
when we're teaching through structured literacy in a multi-sensory way, we will often have students uh, work through a dictated sentence so that we're increasing the cognitive load of um, the phonological and the code-based skills that we're teaching. And we're wanting to take those to that situation of a dictated sentence so that we are increasing the load and potentially working to mirror what the demand is like more so when they're in um, an everyday sort of writing passage. What we find in that instance, Tracy, is that often, you know, we give the sentence to the student and we, we may have done quite a lot of work for them, but they'll get a couple of words into that sentence and then they'll turn and they'll look at us and often they'll say, what was the sentence miss? Mm -hmm. And this can be after we have had them verbally rehearse, we've shown the sentence, they've read it, they've seen it. So I just wanted to share that little um, piece with you to see if you had any um, tip bits or tools for us to be thinking about using in our practice when we're helping those students to be able to work through a fairly contrived and well-supported task. Yeah, and that's another great example of how the words may not be automatized, especially when it comes to spelling in this instance. So while they may be able to rehearse it because there's no distraction, so you give the sentence, they say it back, there's no um, interfering information that would block them from repeating it to mm. you. So as an educator, you think that's great, it's already encoded, but unfortunately it's not because what happens next is that their spelling holds them back because that word may not be automatized. So let's say they have to use the word holiday and they have to, that word is not automatized in their broker's area. And so as a result, their working memory has to step in and think, okay, does that start with an H? Is that a J? Is that what happens? Is it two L's in the sentence? What comes next? Mm -hmm. So as a result, that sentence, which they could rehearse to you with no intervening distractions, it's almost like, you know, you're walking out the door and you're saying to yourself, okay, I have to do these three things. And then one of your children says, hey, mom, I need help. And then you think, <laughs> That's what's happening with them, but with spelling. So spelling is interfering and saying, hey, we don't know how to spell this word. And working memories resources get diverted to say, oh, I better focus on this right now. And so when they come back to it, they've forgotten the sentence. So the tip then is to try to, if you're building that cognitive load, is to focus on words that you know are automatized for that particular student. Mm. Or that that word is written in front of them. So the working memory focuses on piecing the sentence together and not on being distracted by spelling those words. So you may say, we're going to write these words, but I've also put the spelling of these words, these new words or unfamiliar words in front of you. So all you have to do is look at the word instead mm. of spell the word and put it in the sentence. Yeah, that's, that's, really, uh, uh, that's really interesting because I think how for many of us we've been approaching that is thinking that, um, we probably haven't been truly understanding enough the impact of the purpose of building the working memory through that process. I think we've been focusing too much on uh, believing the purpose of the dictated sentence is to see whether or not they can spell those words. Mm -hmm. And what I've picked up from what you've said is that to get into that state and be able to complete that sentence, there needs to be, those words need to pretty much be encoded. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's great for us to think about. Let's now go to a mathematics example uh, and think about, I, I want to sort of go to a problem solving example. You know, you talked earlier about um, we have to hold all that information in mind. So if we're thinking about when we're working with our students or our children, and um, we're, not, we're not solving basic facts in isolation, but we're more working with a story problem that involves multi-steps and is requiring us to work through a number of mathematical processes. What would your tip be um, for us to be supporting working memory through that process? Is this a word problem that they listen to and have to keep in mind or that they're reading? Both. Okay. Yeah, so because we, we would want them to have um, read it and we would want them to have um, heard it, and particularly if they were a, a child who had a reading difference, they would need potentially the problem read to them as well. Yes, and I was just going to say that there's a lot of comorbidity, I'm sure, as you know, Carla, between individuals with dyslexia and dyscalculia math difficulties yes. as well. 
first thing to peel apart is, is reading a problem? And if not, we'll start with reading the text. And at that point, I would use a couple of tools. One is a pencil to track and mark their place. So they do the first step, put a line, a clear indicator. So it's a signal to their brain that I'm first going to read the first sentence mm. only, and then write that down. So maybe it says, Susie has five marbles. All right, I write the number five with the letter S for Susie. So instead of trying to read everything and then break it down, do it almost chunk by chunk. So they sure. don't Load their working memory. Uh, and I would suggest the same strategy even with hearing that auditorily or verbally. So if the teacher is saying that, the student could have their pencil to hand to say, okay, she said Susie S quick shorthand number five for marbles and then the next part and so on. Yeah, that's great. So the key there is so that the working memory resources are focused on solving the math problem, not recalling the math problem, mm. which is often conflated so sometimes with word problems it's especially difficult to know did the child did the student fail because they did not remember the question or because they did not know how to solve the problem so using a step-by-step -step approach will let you as the educator tease that apart so if you can see that the steps are correct but they still approach failure then you know that they don't know the, the mathematical Thanks. rules mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but if they are having to hold everything in mind then that could be a working memory problem there Mm. So, um, Tracy, that leads me then to um, acquiring, I'm going to say, basic facts and um, having the ability to um, commit those to long-term memory. And so I wondered if you would just speak a little bit to um, the challenges that present through working memory and my ability to commit to long-term memory, particularly things like basic facts and times tables and mathematics. Yeah, in fact, brain imaging studies are on the side of committing those and automatizing them in the same way that we do. So math facts are analogous to phonological sounds in the same way that we know that bat and cat rhyme. We need to know our multiplication uh, tables. And so a brain imaging study from Stanford was published a few years ago, and they looked at college students and compared them to third graders, so nine-year-olds. And they found that the nine-year-olds, when they were given uh, multiplication questions, were activating a part of the brain called the IPS, which mm -hmm. is Again, the analogy, uh, the, you know, the parallel, if you will, to the broker's area when it comes to math, the math storehouse. Sure. So right away, Wayne went to, what is three times three? Yep, I have that, and I'm pulling that out, right out. Now, the college students, because that information was no longer frequently used and no longer automated, they were using their working memory. So they were actually having to stop and think, oh, wait, 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 I know this, hang on, I, I know that three times two is this, so I just add. So they were actually working on it rather than pulling out that automatized piece of mm. information, which is more effortful, especially when you have a multi-step problem. And so what you're saying, there's lots of research to support the idea of drilling or automatizing, if you prefer, these facts so that the children have it as a ready resource to say, I already know what three times four is. All I need to do now is use my working memory to solve the problem, not do the math itself. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it, 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 is, it is absolutely crucial in my experience that we work really hard to build up those autom automated facts mm -hmm. so that they are there on tap like that. And in language, we would call that, we, we would say we've orthographically mapped that sound to symbol, or we'd say we've orthographically mapped that word and it's and, and it becomes a, a sight word in our um you know in that back left hemisphere and that in that lobe and so I'm 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 thinking that there is exactly the same process in mathematics. You know, we've got those there and we retrieve them um, in the same way. The challenge seems to be for some just getting them there. And what you're saying is that there is great research around the drilling of those and the repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, well, there are a couple of great tips, you know, Carla, when you talked about how do we get that in, mm -hmm. um, one key tip is to have the children do that just before bedtime. So there's research to show that sleeping on it really does have wow. a science. It. In, and we're not entirely sure about the mechanisms that are happening, but we do know that memories are consolidated much better when learned before sleep compared to early first thing in the day as well as midday. Um, and in part, it could be that we don't have any distracting information. So if we do our multiplication tables and then sleep on it, literally, there's nothing else coming to distract us. We're not watching Netflix or looking on social mm -hmm. media. Kind of fill up our brain or our memory stores. It kind of locks it in, if you mm. will. So 
Leap is a quick way to do that. Um, another is to do pop quizzes and the, the mechanism behind that. So even if you don't grade the students, even doing that, uh, harnesses something called deep processing of information. So often, and I say this to my college students as well when I teach them that we have a shallow method of processing information. And that is, and, and college students do this too. And I found that in a, in a piece of research I recently completed where they think that rereading will be an not only adequate, but an efficient way of learning for an mm. exam. But our brains are so efficient that when it sees that information, it says, hey, this isn't novel. I already know this. I'm not going to give any more resources to this. So we may think, you know, I've read this chapter six times, or I've read this multiplication set six times. It's going to really kind of go in there. But it's just shallow processing because our brain's saying, I can tune out. I can think about yeah. what I want tomorrow. So the pop quizzes forces our brain to go to a deeper level to actually say, okay, now I have to think six times seven. I'm not just looking at it on a table. I'm processing that at a, at a much more mm. level. Uh, I, I imagine under that pop quiz circumstance too, you're, you're so much more heightened to the task because of the fact that you haven't been there before, like you were talking about with, um, with reading through the chapter. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember Tracy, when I, when I purchased your book, um, how do I remember all, all of that? As if I got the title right, I haven't got it in yeah. front of me right now, but how do I remember that? And um, my own son at the time was studying for his, um, what we call secondary school exams. Mm -hmm. And the tip that you've just shared about doing the review just before bedtime, we did that. And, <laughs> and we tried the dark chocolate too. <laughs> <laughs> favorite in our household as well <laughs> yeah yeah so let's go there now let's go to because that is such a great um such a great book for parents and teachers to pick up and just have lots of really useful tools but also for the children themselves to read if they're capable of reading can mm -hmm. we go to um perhaps from that text what are your five most favorite tips <laughs> That's great. So I would probably um, categorize them on a continuum of time, starting from a slow acting. So in other words, it takes time to build up to see those benefits to a medium acting to a fast release. If someone's really impatient saying, you know what, I put everything off to the last minute, <laughs> every power ASAP. So we'll start with the slow acting and food is my favorite tip. Um, the first is flavonoid rich foods. Dark chocolate is one of them. And flavonoids are what gives the color in the food, the blue in blueberries, the green in kale and in spinach. So as we know, those take a little while to accumulate, but they are very effective. So again, um, if you have a few weeks to build up that memory superpower, flavonoid rich foods are a great one to opt for. Um, the second is also a slow acting food base and that is um, omega-3 or DHA enriched foods. Now the only caveat is that there is a difference between children and adults in how you benefit from that. Children benefit from supplements of omega-3 as well as food sources. Adults, um, the research shows, tend to benefit more from the food source and less so from the supplement. So a little caveat, if you are working with adult learners, that omega-3 in particular is most beneficial uh, for adults from a food source. So we've got two flavonoids, omega-3. The third one will jump right into a moderate acting. And this is, um, you can see benefits in as little as 16 minutes. And it was a study I did with the College of Health wow. here at the University. And I found that by taking off your shoes and running, and we weren't on an indoor track, we had our runners run with shoes, without shoes, focusing on these little targets on the ground and, and having no targets on the ground. And we found that after 16 minutes, so one six, not, a, not six zero, <laughs> but um, three things made an impact. One, they were self-paced, we controlled for heart rate, all those other factors. One, as long as they ran for 16 minutes, we saw a over 20% improvement in their working memory. We also found that it made a difference if they um, were looking at a target. So if you are in a treadmill or if you're outside in a park or something, train yourself to jump to a target. You know, as kids, when you say, I'm only going to jump on the cracks and I'm going to skip all the rest. It's that kind of principle. You want to focus on a target because that's engaging your working memory. Mm. So we've got time the attention. And the third is the bare feet. We found that um, running without shoes, 
focusing on a target for 16 minutes improved working memory by 16 uh, by over 20 percent so that's my quick wow. acting um, yeah. right there um, another is also in the moderate zone and that is um, drawing so this was a study that we published last year, and we were looking at individuals with a stress disorder versus no stress disorder. And we found, we compared coloring a mandala, which is those circular objects, yeah, that's cool, yeah. art therapy, um, as well as drawing on an empty piece of paper. We looked at stress measures, anxiety measures, and working memory. And we found that giving them a blank piece of paper and saying you have 20 minutes to draw anything you want, improved their working memory significantly. And in part, because you have to come up with a goal. You have to think, what am I going to draw? Mm -hmm. What are the steps that I need to take to execute that goal? So if you have 20 minutes and you want a quick memory boost, pull out a blank sheet of paper and think of what to draw. Yeah. That's my a, Go oh, ahead. sorry. So I was just going to say, that's a great tip for um, a lot of our children do like to draw. And a lot of them are very, 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 very good at drawing. So again, it's nice to be able to bring in that strength or that area of passion as yes. also um, an, an area that's going to really be beneficial for them going forward. That's right. Yeah. And so my fifth and final tip is the fast acting. If you're saying, you know, I don't, I don't want to spend 20 minutes. I want something now. Um, and that's this research looking at essential oils, specifically in rosemary and peppermint. Mm. And they found that it releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine which is our memory neurotransmitter. It's also the first to start declining as we age. And they found that um, having uh, drops of peppermint and rosemary in an inhaler significantly improved working memory. So I do know some teachers in the classroom will have that on exam day or test day um, yeah. as a parent to do that. If you're finding your child struggling a little bit with some homework or studying for an exam, that's a, a quick, fast acting way to improve your working memory. Wow, such such a great range of, of tips. I'm sure that there will be something in there for everybody. I particularly like the last one. Um, I use peppermint myself and I don't I don't diffuse it, but I um, have the have the roller and I find at three o'clock in the afternoon as I'm starting to, to hit my three o'clock slump, um, yeah, it's a real it, it's a pick me up. And so that's really, really interesting to hear. Um, what you great. Seen. I love how you use that, Carla. That's fantastic. Yeah, it, it's, it, it works. And I love the smell. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. very uplifting. So, wow, so many great tips. And, you know, I think um, what we see at times in, in different research, or we say, oh, you know, you can't improve working memory or um, there's no transference. Um, the tips and tools that you've really given us today have been really beneficial for how we manage that. And I'm going to say how we facilitate learning opportunities for our students in particular or older students that we work with to have them to be able to achieve success because we all have the potential to learn. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Often, often I will be heard saying that working memory is one of the biggest predictors of academic success, Tracy. So I'd like to sort of begin to round up. I've got two more questions, this being one of them. Um, in terms of that statement, working memory being one of the biggest predictors of academic success, and I can hear Dr. Susan Gathercole in my ear um, <laughs> saying exactly that as I ask you this question. Can you just talk briefly to that statement? Yes, of course. It's actually my work with Sue that started um, a lot of my interest in working memory, I'm sure, as you know, Carla. Um, but one of my first projects together with um, Sue was looking at kindergarten age children. So four or five year olds, they start quite young in the UK where I was based at the time. And we wanted to look at predictors of learning outcomes. So in other words, if you had these wonderful, excited kids ready to learn, could you distill it into one or two key cognitive skills that you would say these are essential indicators of learning outcomes. So we started with kids all across the UK, different demographic backgrounds, had a few hundred of them, and then we followed them over a few years. And in my own research, I was able to pick up on a cohort of them even six years later. And I found that the working memory scores at five years of age was predicting how well these kids were doing six years later on standardized assessments of reading and in math. So, wow. and this was, you know, controlled for IQ levels and all of these other cognitive skills as well. Wow, that's incredible. So my last um, area to, to chat with you about is I just wanted to 
um, touch on, you've written 13 books. Um, <laughs> I haven't read all 13 of them, but I have read a lot of them. Um, and I, I want to thank you for the very succinct way that you write. And um, you write with such clarity. And it, you're, I find that your texts are um, suitable for both parents and um, I guess those who are studying um, in higher education and for those who are in education. They are wonderful, Tracy, to pick up and read through and um, so relevant to what we do. And I mentioned to you before we came on this, uh, before we started recording, that uh, your, your um, first edition of Understanding Working Memory, or it might have, was it Improving Working Memory? I can't remember quite. I don't know if you changed the title, but um, that, yeah. was, that was the starting point for, for me in, in this journey. And um, I'd like to think that there are many children and parents across the country and teachers who um, will be grateful for me having read that book because I've gone on to spread the good word or your good word to many, many of them. So how, how do people access your books? What is the best way? And I will, um, in our comment thread, when I post this um, on our page, I will link in um, the books. But where is the best place for people to access your books? Um, Amazon, they're all on Amazon. Uh, my website, tracyalloway.com, has links to Amazon. And I also do a lot of videos, both with the um, television here. Uh, sometimes they cover topics like author autism, ADHD, reading difficulties. So they're usually one minute clips or two minute clips and so on. So again, if there's a parent that wants to know a little bit more, um, mm. my research articles are also there. If there's some, you know, like yourself, want to know a little bit more about the mechanisms behind what's going on. So there's resources for everyone um, on my website as well. That's wonderful. Thank you so, so much for your time this morning. Well, it's actually not this morning for you, is it? <laughs> it's no. this afternoon for you. And uh, yeah, thank you. So I know you said you were, you were on a sabbatical, but you're heading back to teaching next week. Is that correct? Yes, I've, I've missed my students and I'm looking forward to being able to be with them again. Yeah. <laughs> virtually, virtually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hey, well, Tracy, I just want to, on behalf of everybody who... Um, has been watching here with us in New Zealand. I want to thank you so much for, for dedicating your life to the work you do. It, it really is making a difference and it is making a difference globally, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and it's really inspiring and empowering. And to have had the opportunity to connect with you today and to talk that through and just share a little bit more insight into, into your work and the tips and tools um, that you have found to be tried and true. I know there will be lots of parents and lots of educators across New Zealand who go out with increased rigor and increased um, research and evidence base behind some of their practices to make a difference for their students. So thank you so, so much from all of us for, for the time that you have given us today. Thank you, Carla. It's been a pleasure and hopefully I can visit everyone in person. Yeah, we, we would love that. We, um, let those, let the... Um, border control drop and um, be great to have some more experts like yourself in our beautiful country to spread the great word. <laughs>